Hello and welcome. My name is Ramendra Wright and I will be your host for this TLC session. We are excited that you have joined us today for developing a career as a veteran in human resources management. Please welcome Dr. Katie Theory, Philip Dana, and Christina Matos. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Katie Theory. Program Chair for the Master of Human Resource Management and Bachelor of Arts in Human Resources Management degree programs in the Forbes School of Business and Technology and your moderator for this session, Developing a Career as a Veteran in Human Resources Management, a track within the Teaching and Learning Conference coordinated by the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning with cooperation from Ashford University's Military and Veteran Task Force. Before I introduce our experts, I'd like to recognize and honor our students, employees, staff, and guests who have served or are serving in the United States Armed Forces. Please take this time to introduce yourselves in the chat if you have not already. It's great to see so many familiar names, whether from LinkedIn, our HRM associate faculty, it's great to see you here as well. Again, hello and welcome to everyone joining us in the live session. Hello to current students, Ashford alum, faculty, staff, Ashford's military population, and HR practitioners from the learning community at large. In just a moment, I will turn the mic over to Philip Dana, VP of Talent Acquisition and HR Operations and Total Rewards, and Christina Matos, Director of HR Shared Services at Bridgepoint Education. Before our panelists share their bios, please type in the chat where you're joining us from, your military service if applicable, your current position, your educational and career goals, how you might know our panelists, and what questions you have for them. So likely you didn't anticipate being part of this panel, but I see many familiar names in our live roster and I know that you have equally as impressive credentials and field experience to also share. So please type in the chat box. I'll do my best to keep up with your comments and field your questions to our panelists. So Phil and Chris will each provide a bio framed up through the lens of their career path, their unique background, service, education, and experience. Together, as you might have read in the description for this session, their careers span eight sectors and 11 companies. First up, with 15 years of military experience and 13 years in the civilian sector, Philip Dana, VP of Talent Acquisition, HR Operations and Total Rewards at Bridgepoint Education. Phil, the mic is all yours. Hey everyone, uh, pleasure to join you this morning, especially after a Veterans Day uh, weekend. A little bit about myself, I am the 20th man in my family to serve in the military. I grew up as a Navy dependent over in Asia. My father was a 27 year Navy warrant officer. My grandfather was a Marine in Iwo Jima. <clears throat> so naturally, um, I enlisted and after two deployments, snuck into the Naval Academy as the old guy and uh, survived the academic uh, rigor to become an officer for a few years, all, uh, mostly here in, in San Diego and six deployments uh, overseas. Um, about 14 years in the military and now 15 years in HR. You can see my, my track of different brands. Um, I've learned a lot. I've had a lot of veterans join me in HR and so I'm excited to encourage uh, and inspire more to have an amazing career of service, to serve others, your organizations and your fellow humans as a HR professional. Um, at the bottom, you can uh, see some of my uh, personality, uh, midlife crisis, a F Navy football fan. My wife and I rescue pit bulls and I am a lifelong Seahawks fan, so go Hawks. Turn it over to Chris, introduce herself. Um, it looks like Chris got kicked off of Zoom here, uh, so she'll, hopefully she'll be back with us here in a few moments. But um, Katie, I guess if you want to just take it from there and we can circle back to Chris here in a moment once she gets back. 
Absolutely. Let me know when she's back on if it, the system doesn't already alert me. But I, I'll share with those that have joined the session. I have questions prepared for Phil and Chris when she returns, but this is not a rehearsed presentation. It's a shared live dialogue. So if you don't have questions, that's okay. I have plenty of my own, as you'll soon see on the screen, but your questions will take priority. So I appreciate you sharing in the, in the group chat your experience and perhaps what brought you to this session. So um, Phil, if Chris is not already on, do we want to, I don't, I don't want to leave Chris out, but do we want to roll through some of our initial questions um, from your perspective and then we will return to Chris? Yeah, let's go. Fantastic. Well, perhaps we should just start with the top of the list. Um, and I'll direct this question as well to our participants, those of you that are joining us from HR, in addition to Phil and Chris. Why, why HR? Why did you choose a career in HR of all the fields that you may have selected, Phil? Yeah, three-part answer. I'll, I'll, sp I'll speak fast because I'm Irish. Um, one is the DNA of being an Irishman, being raised in an Irish family, loving to connect uh, and being around uh, other people. Um, Growing up in Asia, around the Asian culture, it's very uh, tribe, family focused. Um, and then uh, going to high school, Canadian border in North Idaho in a log cabin without electricity. So I really love people. <laughs> uh, when I got out of the military, I was actually a construction leader building houses in Vegas, but um, I did a lot of my own recruiting a lot of the on own onboarding leadership development programs and some folks at headquarters, uh, including a reserve officer, told me I'd be good at HR and I didn't even know what HR really was. And so, um, you know, I listened to a mentor who knew me in the military and had known the civilian world. So I think that's a key point to maybe hit on later is I suspect there are many like me and I've met quite a few military leaders who are in HR that weren't uh, necessarily HR uh, in the military and did not have a predestined path to become HR. In fact, most of us didn't even know what HR was. So that's a key point. Now, Phil, um, I see that Chris is, Chris is back. So we're going to, to go back a slide. Um, but as we transition to that, something that you said, um, someone told you that you'd be good at HR. So after, um, Chris provides us with her background. Um, that's something that I might ask both of you as a follow-up question. Um, what, what was that 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 individual noted about you and your experience and the skill set that you had that um, they recognized that you'd be great at HR? So without further ado, I turn it over to Chris. Glad that you're back with us. Let's do an audio check. Ladies and gentlemen, Christina Matos, Director of HR Shared Services at Bridgepoint Education. Hi everyone. Can you can you hear me okay, Katie? Phil? Yes. Working okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, all of a sudden it went into a loop and I got kicked out. So I apologize for the delay and the, uh, the issues. Um, thanks all though for being here. And unfortunately, I didn't get to uh, hear Phil's introduction. That would have set the standard and the bar for what I needed to present. But a uh, quick summary: I'm originally a New Yorker, now living in San Diego. So happy to be here in the nice warm weather. Uh, Started out my career in the service by enlisting with the intent to go to a service academy. And so like Phil, I graduated in 98 and uh, immediately went to uh, a, a Navy ship. Surface warfare uh, was, my, uh, was my dream. I wanted to travel around the world. I wanted to play with guns um, on board a, a big deck amphib. And uh, at the same time, I had a love for the Marine Corps, uh, just from my family history, but also in that it was one of the career paths that I had considered post-academy. And uh, with an AMFIB, I was able to get that experience and, uh, and fulfill that, that need. Um, my husband was also uh, a former military officer in the Marine Corps. And with my last tour, I was a liaison to the Second Marine Expeditionary Force, where I was their um, new planner, naval gunfire liaison officer, and then liaison for anything that involved Navy and Marine Corps 
uh, collaboration. And that was the greatest experience that I, uh, that could, I, I could have hoped for, uh, but I desired uh, mostly to uh, transition to a career in the corporate world. And so in 2005, uh, made my leap out into the wild, wild west. I've been on both coasts in both the service, but also growing up and then um, just in my desires to live uh, opposite of what New York was. So I've gone the extremes and now I'm here. And over the course of the last few years, I've been at uh, numerous startups, uh, wind power industry, uh, technology, uh, and then interspersed between all of those, uh, really recognize the value, uh, particularly in becoming an HR professional. What I found was I did not have the pedigree needed when you're looking at going out and presenting yourself as an HR professional in the world. They're asking for that typical upbringing of perhaps have the degree, but then also um, have that upbringing where perhaps you're doing some time as a coordinator or an administrator and then growing up. So I had to do it by the fire hose uh, with that startup experience. And then I got the rest of it through school. And so online community through Villanova in their first HR program back in 2009. Um, and then uh, more recently in a blended environment for a graduate degree in international business and global leadership at University of San Diego here locally. Um, been with Bridgepoint for a handful of months now and it is one of the most complete experiences um, that I could think of for an HR professional. So that's my intro. Thank you, Chris. We started with the um, the questions that you see on your screen, and we don't necessarily have to go in order that we see them on the screen. Perhaps you have um, the passion discussing one or the other, but we do have a question from Carlos that I want to make sure we get to actually first, um, because as participants, your questions take priority over mine, take precedence over mine. Carlos, first, thank you for your service. Um, who asks, what is the hardest part of translating the HR competencies from the military HR world to a civilian HR position, especially at the senior level? So whichever one of you want to tackle that first. Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's got to be anchored in the passion. You have immense leadership experiences and the amount of training that goes into anybody that's been in the military for a few years is, is amazing. And I find myself still reflecting back on some of the courses, some of the indoctrination programs that I went through as both enlisted and an officer. And, and I still reach back into that toolbox. So I think, you know, one of the things that I learned at Amazon in the early days we, we were beginning to hire a tremendous amount of military, but Jeff Bezos warned me specifically to not create a culture similar to Sears Holdings, where we had a ton of military, probably 40, I think 44,000 employees were part of our ERG, our employment resource group. And he, he warned me, don't, I better not see, you know, uh, ribbons and cubes decorated like bunkers and all that kind of stuff. I prefer that you know, veterans come here and become Amazonian, become peculiar. And I really, you know, don't want to dwell on where they came from and that included MBA, included anybody. And it really struck home with me. And then a year later, one of my mentors told me that he had been at Amazon for uh, two years and one of his stakeholders was caught off guard in a meeting on one of his uh, Navy uh, stories and said, I didn't know that you're in the Navy. And to me, that's a tremendous um, compliment where your skill sets, your knowledge, your passion lead before uh, your time in the military. I think if you lead into relationships with your time in the military, it might set you back. It might be more challenging. And of course, that depends on the, the culture of what company you're a part of. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking the question, Carlos. Bill, thank you for your response. Chris, what about you? Why a career, a career in HR? We heard a bit about why a military career, um, but why HR? Sure, so uh, I think it's, uh, it holds true for many people that end up 
working and operating in HR, you fall into it. I was at my first startup uh, post-military service uh, where a handful of us were asked to join this company just because of our military experience. They were looking for people who weren't afraid to uh, be in that risky business uh, where you're not sure if it's going to take off or fail. And, um, you know, we all showed up and you took on whatever jobs um, you could manage. And uh, it, was, it was almost like a menu. Everybody started picking and choosing. And at one point, uh, we got infused with quite a bit of cash and there was an opportunity for us to choose our destiny, choose our path. And uh, it was presented to me that with the hopes to grow the company, uh, to about 250 personnel from the 10 of us that were there at the time within six months. He asked if I was up to the challenge and I said, absolutely, uh, I'll, I'll figure things out. And with uh, some mentorship that came from outside of the company, uh, it was so diverse a function that uh, even to this day, it's, it's why most people should gravitate to it or do gravitate to it coming out of the service because you're never doing the same thing day in, day out. Um, it's always a surprise of what that day will hold for you, but you're used to operating in that ambiguity. And so um, once, once I felt that I had an affinity for it and I also was doing a decent job of it, I decided that this is now the career path that I will choose. Both of you seem to allude to the skills of leadership and what I heard there in that response, Chris, was a confidence in execution and action. Um, Phil, going back to something that you said, someone told you that you'd be good at HR. Is there, is there a link to that thread of leadership and a, and a confidence in execution or what would you say that that particular individual saw in you which prompted them to suggest HR? Well, I think like most of us that have served, you have to figure out new commands, new systems, new cultures, everything's new um, uh, every 18 months at least, right? And so when I pivoted into HR, there wasn't HR. I didn't have anybody in HR around me and I had to hire 1,100 people that year. We were faxing I-9s to headquarters down in Dallas from the Las Vegas desert as we were building houses and you know I, I just used the organizational skills um, first on last off talk to everybody ask them how they're doing remember what they say being a very active listener um, program management attention to detail the follow-through just showing everybody that you care and that you're a human being um, I think is, is part of what's allowed me to grow in an HR career. It's also what made me, I think, a good officer, remembering my enlisted roots and uh, remembering where I came from. So I, you know, I think great HR leaders listen to the needs of the business, listen to the people, follow through quickly, uh, prioritize and execute. And uh, that sure sounds like being a military leader to me. Well, one of the reasons, well, several reasons I was honored to participate in the session with, with all of you is to share my appreciation for servicemen and women and, and their families, of course, and also share my genuine passion for learning and the field of HR. Um, so I, I feel like I'm in this, this luxurious position of that, that learning process. It's my job to continue learning. And um, what I'm getting at is something that, Chris, you had mentioned, um, didn't have the pedigree um, for the field. And so I wanna shift the conversation a bit to that pedigree, what you meant by that, um, and then wanted to get both of your thoughts about credentialing in HR. And I alluded to my luxury of, of getting to learn in the field um, because I wanna put myself in the position to experience what our students experience. And uh, so speaking of credentialing, um, can, we can you, um, refer to your experiences with credentialing and why you've made some of the career choices, the professional development choices that you have. So I think um, I didn't want anybody to misunderstand the pedigree in the background. Uh, and frankly, uh, nowadays, 
in the fact that the Navy is able to offer an HR officer career, I think helps many of those make that transition a lot easier than perhaps um, years ago when I was making the change. When I hit the, um, the job market, to be able to show someone the value of my military experience and how it translates was really challenging. Um, if it wasn't for that first opportunity in the startup, uh, taking that bet on me, um, I would not have been able to get that experience without that formidable background that most employers were looking for. And that's, again, having the either the degree in HR or having those years building it up over time. Uh, so having someone to be able to advocate with, uh, with a company on your behalf um, and helping translate that experience, uh, that, was, that was very important for me uh, afterward. Uh, in, in that time, though, what I did recognize, something like the HRCI, uh, the SPHR, the PHR credentials, and now the SHRM credentials that are available to you, um, for a generalist or for anyone who is going in and, and really concentrating on um, an, a career in HR that serves as the single operator, you're the single professional within, um, within that organization, companies do look to that um, as someone who has proved themselves in the career path um, through not only testing, but through the experience to be able to even qualify to take that test. And so in my last few roles, it has been a requirement for the companies that I was interviewing with for me to have those credentials um, next to my name, to have proven that year over year as we're expected to stay on trend and up to date with what's happening and changing in the, uh, in the profession, that we're making that a priority in our development and that it's being returned uh, to the organizations that we're a part of. So I can't speak enough to, um, at least for myself, the value that both of those credentials um, have given to my, um, my ability to provide an impact to that organization, but then also staying in contact with other professionals uh, and, and staying up with what's happening in our organizations. Thank you, Chris. Phil, what about you? I'm on the other end of the spectrum, um, which is great. That's why Chris and I are on the same team together. I don't have any credentials. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised I just got through college. That was tough enough. I'm just a dumb kid from North Idaho. Um, but I uh, have learned to work really hard growing up on a farm, growing up in the wilderness. I get up every morning, still today at 5 a.m., and I spend 30 to 45 minutes reading uh, on my profession. And so if this was a dojo, I would not rest on being a black belt because some new black belt's going to come along and kick me and it's going to hurt. So um, I stay sharp. I stay relevant. I stay current. Um, I also have learned to appreciate my strengths and my weaknesses. Um, maybe it's where I am in my career and my age or how many times I've failed but I know that I'm not a credentialed or somebody that will sit in class and learn easily. I'm, I put me in a room with a bunch of smart people and, and I'll learn through that interaction. Um, so I think, you know, you have to know your strengths. You have to know um, a path. If you have a path, it's a lot easier to answer this question. I'm also somebody that's never got a job by applying to it. And so I'm a networking freak of nature. So that's always helped as well. Well, that's one of the reasons as well that we're delighted to be able to participate in a conference like this and reach so many. And, and I'm just grateful for those of you that work in HR, our external, so to speak, visitors um, who are interested in networking with our current students and Ashford alums. So um, thank you for being here, all of you. But Phil, beyond formal education and credentials, something that you alluded to were, was um, staying current in the field by kind of being a self-directed uh, learner on a regular basis, what resources, both Phil and Chris, do you use on a regular basis? Do you recommend to those of us in the field to tap into? Yeah, I, I think having a, a learning strategy, um, a networking strategy is a good one. Um, 
I am in HR.com. I subscribe to several feeds on LinkedIn and Twitter to coordinate my morning learning sessions over coffee. There's certain topics that benefit us as an organization. So therefore me as an HR leader right now, we're, you know, um, transforming our total reward strategy. We're implementing Workday, which is the leading HR technology suite. And so there's specific topics, specific sources that I pay a little more attention to than others. I have a personal board of advisors. There are six CHROs, two of them retired that uh, I have regular cups of coffee or a beer with to pick their brain and help shape my career and bounce things off of. I have a set of peers that I reach out to when I have a challenge here at work and vice versa, they reach out to me. I think that's critical. There are some of those master sites like CEB Gardner. Uh, that's just a wealth of, of knowledge and information. You can spend weeks and weeks and weeks on their website and not get through all the material. So I think those are great critical. If you look around my office, you'll see HR Executive Magazine, Talent Management Magazine, and a bunch of other uh, solid readings um, as well. So I don't know if Chris has got some additionals. Well, Phil, Phil is the, uh, the king of networking. Um, I probably, I can't speak enough to that, to be able to find others uh, in your profession, in your cohort, um, in your past life from your military careers that you should stay in contact with um, to learn from what are they doing, what are they experiencing at their company, keeping your network open. Uh, across the country, you know, my cousin works at an organization that they're moving into a different space and you know I asked hey can you introduce me to your your HR professionals at your company because I think that we'd like to be able to understand your lessons learned and what we could do to to ensure we're on the right path so the network is so important uh, to to your just everyday learning and or your future opportunities uh, the other thing is just having those go-to materials um, Depends on where you're at, uh, what you have access to, either through your employer or as a student. Um, SHRM has a daily feed uh, that covers most of the United States and also uh, global uh, organizations and how you would operate in the HR environments there. Uh, there's also business news. My uh, Flipboard news feed is covered with uh, professional growth and development um, articles. And so it'll bring everything in from the New York Times to Forbes to, to business um, literature. And so uh, I like Phil, I, I'll read as much as I can um, on a daily basis to figure out what I can adopt from each of those various media points. Well, speaking of networking, I put the website link in the chat box, fsptshermchapter.org is the Forbes School of Business and Technology SHRM sponsor or sponsored SHRM chapter. You're all certainly invited to join us, network there, and connect our communities. With the limited time that we have left, just a few minutes, um, 90 seconds, um, are there any questions that are listed on your screen, Phil or Chris, that you um, could elaborate on or share within that amount of time? I don't see additional questions in the chat box unless I've missed any from our participants. So um, any closing thoughts or responses to some of those questions that we haven't gotten to? I started our uh, Veterans Day celebration this morning at Bridgepoint where we did a flag raising with the employees that are veterans and spouses. When I used the lesson that Chris and I had to memorize at the Naval Academy in our plebe year, which was um, pretty brutal, but an easy thing to remember, ship, shipmate, self. And so with that in mind, um, these students that are going through that are veterans, you know, I welcome uh, your LinkedIn invitation. I saw a couple of them come across today. And if there's anything I can do to help ever uh, from a fellow vet in HR, please let me know. Yeah, and I'd, I'd reiterate that. Please, uh, please connect with us. Uh, we'd love to be able to share with you our challenges, our experiences, how we came over them. Uh, and then also, you know, if there's any introductions or, or guidance we can help provide you in your careers, uh, we'd love to be able to be a resource to you. 
Phil and Chris, thank you so much for being candid with your professional experiences and thank you to our guests who have joined us. This session is one of five military track presentations and you're all invited to attend the keynote at 2 p.m. Pacific time, Maurice Wilson, U.S. Navy veteran and president and executive director of National Veteran Transition Services will be presenting at 2 p.m. Again, that specific time today. I hope you can join us for it. Um, in the meantime, uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation with all of you and I'll turn it over to her minor. Dean Army. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Katie Theory, Philip Dana, and Christina Matos for your presentation and for all of you joining in this TLC session. Um, enjoy the rest of TLC.